Today I have the pleasure of speaking with Ian Chalmers of Alkane Resources. How are you today, Ian? Great, thanks Tracy. Nice to talk to you again. Well, Ian, I'll tell you, we were delighted to see you're what, one of the top 50 uh, performing OTC stocks last year. Is that correct? Yeah, it was great. I mean, I, was, I must have been, I was quite surprised, but uh, no, it was great to see. It's great, it's great that we get some recognition for, for everything that's going on in the company. Well, and speaking of recognition, you're coming to North America May 15th and 16th to speak at the Clean Tech and Technology Metal Summit. Is that correct? Yes, I am. I'm looking forward to it. I hope you just turn on the warm, bit of warm weather, that's all. And of course, Ian, you're going to be one of the featured speakers at the Clean Tech and Technology Metal Summit May 15th and 16th. Can you share with us what you plan on speaking about as Alkane Resources is a multi-commodity play? Yes, we, we, we thought this time we'd do something slightly different. I mean, we've always talked about the project or financing the project and those sort of things. But we would like this year to talk about Hathium. And we think it's appropriate that we bring up Hathium to the, the broader audience because Hathium is a fascinating metal. And certainly all the work that we've done in the last two, three years on Hathium indicates it's, it's one of these metals that really is going to have a big impact on our future. And I, I'd like just to expose the world to some of those sort of you know, fascinating developments. And of course, many of our members of our audience are going, Hafnium what? So, uh, <laughs> Ian, if I could just get you to back up because, you know, I am a believer in Hafnium and the technology that Hafnium can be used for is quite sizzling. But if you could just give some of the Investor Intel audience a bit of an overview. Sure. Look, Hafnium traditionally has been involved with the nuclear industry. It's used in control rods in nuclear reactors. And then most people associate with that. It's a small, very specialized market. In the last 10, 15 years, it's got into special alloys. So it goes into nickel cobalt alloys that are used in high temperature turbines. And a small amount of hafnium has a big impact on its operating temperature. And so it's, 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 it's developed a market in that area. But the exciting things are what's in the pipeline, the things we call ferroelectric. And these are the applications in, in cutting out, in computer chips. Um, hafnium oxide, uh, thin, very thin layers make uh, computers lighter, faster, less energy, less heat, all of those good things that they should do. So that's, that's a development that's been around for, well, again, 15 years, but we're seeing a lot of commercial interest now. And the other one, which is a thermoelectric application, which means it takes a, a hafnium oxide ceramic, converts heat into electricity. And you can imagine a lot of, a lot of potential interest in that just around automobile, automobile engines converting the heat of the automobile back into electricity, uh, going aircraft, spacecraft, all of those exciting things. So they're, they're, those last two are just some of the, some of the big new commercial uh, applications that we see coming and maybe three, four years, but uh, a lot of interest, a lot of excitement in amongst the companies that understand this business. And of course, the demand is outstripping the supply right now. Is that correct? Um, Absolutely. I mean, it's it's a very very opaque market because of the strategic implications. It makes it makes the rare earth industry look positively transparent, which is saying something. But yeah, hafnium is an interesting metal because there are very few Western producers or very few producers at all, and uh, it's uh, just at that point where we're very confident there just isn't the supply around right now to meet anywhere near the demand. Of course, you have a lot of the magic. Uh formula messages our audience likes to hear, you're actually producing gold and we're liking gold in North America a lot. So can you tell us a little bit about your gold project, the Tamingley project? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a small mine, a modest, modest sized mine. It produces around 70,000 ounces of gold a year. It's operating margins sort of in the range of three to four hundred dollars an ounce normally. So and that gives us a good return. Uh, it's been going now for three years. Uh, we opened pit life, it's got another year and a half to go. Uh, and then we would like to expand it by going underground. And we've got another, another project about 15 kilometres away that uh, we can bring on stream at some stage in the future. So we can see it just progressing along at that round that rate of 50 to 70,000 ounces a year and generating 20 to 30 million a year cash flow for us. And it's a nice business. It's very good. You know, it's, it's worked well for us. 
And an update on rare earths. We notice rare earths are trending on Investor Intel. Our top five out of seven stories right now are all rare earth stories. And uh, I'm being told by many economists that they're cautiously optimistic that there's going to be an increase in rare earth prices again this year. What are your thoughts on this and how are you doing with the Dubbo project? Look, we, we absolutely agree. All the feedback that we're getting, the information we're getting out of China is that the dam wall is broken. And uh, realistically now, prices have already started to trickle up. Certainly on things like uh, need in and prosenium, prices are starting to go up. I think that will flow on, not across the board, because we still have this issue with oversupply of things like lanthanum and cerium. But definitely interest growing. We think a lot of the stockpiles are gone. Um, the Chinese government wants its companies to be profitable, and the only way they're going to do that is by putting up prices. So that's great, and it's great for the project and great for the rare earth industry. The other thing that's really interesting for us, and it's probably not something that's caught anybody's attention yet, is, is zirconium. Uh, zirconium chemicals, many of them have jumped 10% in the last uh, last few weeks. The zircon price has gone up. You know, the primary producers, the zircon price is going up. We see a big impact in the second half of the year on, on zirconium and zirconium products, and uh, we see quite big jumps. So very good for Dubbo Project, very good for our revenue streams, and yeah, very happy with all of where all those markets are going. Well, for the record, when you said great, I was going to ask you about zirconium. So let me also give you an opportunity to tell our audience a little bit more about zirconium demand presently and what it's used for, because there may be some investors out there that you know may not uh, uh, fully appreciate what you're talking about. Yeah, it's, it's a bit like the rare earth industry. It's very diverse. When you get into downstream zirconium chemicals, there's an amazing diversity of, of applications. And, and the, the basic ones are refractories. And refractories sound pretty dull and boring. Uh, but when they're used in special glass and special metal areas, they have to be very high purity, very good materials. So they attract a premium price. Then you go up to other uh, ceramic applications like you know, household tiles, for example, use zirconium and, and rare earths in their colouring. And that's another big demand area. Uh, auto catalysts, uh, the catalyst could convert on a car exhaust, uses zirconia. But the, the, again, the real interesting things are in some of the electronic applications, um, dielectric applications, all sorts of things that are used in modern modern technologies. And said so people don't don't know much about it because it's not widely publicised. And of course, Ian, not everybody in the industry may appreciate what a leader you are in the technology metal sector. I mean, you're celebrating your 30th anniversary with Alkane Resources. Can you tell us what we as shareholders should anticipate maybe in the upcoming couple of quarters that you can talk about? Mm. Yeah, yeah, well, thank you for reminding me of that, that great date. Um, look, coming up, we, we have an enormous amount of activity going behind the, behind the scenes. A lot of this stuff is very commercially sensitive. I can't say too much about it. But we have multiple deals, multiple off-take agreements, multiple technology um, working agreements with different companies. And over the next well, the next six months to eight months, the remainder of this year, we see many of these deals crystallising and impacting on the project, impacting on its, on its revenue streams and therefore impacting on its ability to get finance. So it's very important. And you know, so I, I wish I could sit here today and say, you know, Pro, uh, agreement X will be out next week, but it just seems to take an orderly long time to get some of these things finalised and out in the public domain. And, and then you run into the good old issue of uh, companies not wanting their name published uh, for all sorts of commercial reasons. And then we have to work around that issue as to how we how we tell the world we've got this fantastic deal uh, with Company X. And it doesn't sound great, does it, Company X? But, uh, but yeah, there's a lot of those things happening behind the scenes. So for everyone that's planning on ten attending the Clean Tech and Technology Metal Summit in Toronto, May 15th and 16th, we have Ian Chalmers and team coming over from Australia. We look forward to seeing you soon, Ian. Thank you. Thanks, Tracy. Great to talk to you. Thank you.